let's talk about surfaces. The first thing I will say about surfaces when painting children is that the surface is going to be a direct reflection of your subject matter. Meaning if you want to paint something a little bit more rugged, a little bit more rustic, like a rocky, craggy landscape, go with something that has some texture on it. So in this case, I have a canvas that I added extra texture to. This is not something I recommend using for painting kids. So we're gonna throw that out. Uh, here we have an Artifacts Oleo panel, and this is primed, I think, two or three times with lead. It looks like it was rolled on with an actual paint roller. What that does is it creates a nice, smooth, rather uniform surface, but it still has a tiny bit of little bumps on it. So give it a try, see if you like it. I like these for still lives. They could work well for children, um, but I'll show you my preferences next. Here we have an aluminum panel that I actually primed myself with lead. You can see that it sort of has this, this off-white sort of yellowish tint to it. And that's what lead priming does when it's been sitting in the dark. It'll actually revise and turn back to white when it gets hit by sunlight, which is kind of interesting. But what I did was I took a brush and went one direction with my first coat of primer and the opposite direction with my second coat of primer. I could keep doing this for several more layers until it gets to be the amount of smoothness that I want. Two layers might just be the bare minimum. So if I wanted this to be extra smooth, I would add even more. But in my opinion, lead primer is one of the absolute best surfaces you could work on, especially if you're putting it on something like aluminum, it's gonna last forever. So that is something I would recommend for painting children. If you are not in the mood to make your own canvases, which I'm often not, and I often don't have time, you can get some really nice commercially prepared canvases from places like Raymar. And I have this one still in the package. This is a 12 by 16. And this is their C13 DP panel, which is basically a double primed Claussen's Belgian linen. I love this surface for just about any kind of subject matter. It's great for portraits, figures, landscapes, still life, you name it. It's uh, still a fairly fine weave, but it has a bit of the linen tooth still on it. So um, if you like a little bit of texture or tooth to your painting, this might be something to try. Next up from that, this is another Raymar panel, and this is their L64C. So this is Artfix Belgian Linen. It's quadruple oil primed, and it's very, very, very smooth. You can see just a little bit of the linen texture there. Um, when I've worked with this before, I've found that it tends to be maybe a little bit more absorbent. So if you're looking for something that has just a totally smooth surface that you can push the paint around really, really easily, the uh, Claussen's 13 is pretty good for that, or the aluminum panel, or anything that you might oil prime or lead prime for yourself. This one, I recommend actually adding a coat, a very light coat of oleo gel at the start before you start painting. And what that does is it creates a more smooth working surface for you to just really go in there with your paint and be able to push it around. However, if you're the type of painter who likes to have everything set in stone at the beginning, you like to put in your initial drawing and your block in and have it right there and not going anywhere, maybe this is the surface for you. Now, the commercially primed or commercially prepared linen canvases can get very pricey. So if you're looking for something more affordable but still very smooth, I would recommend trying the Jack Richeson gessoed hardboard. They can come in several different tones. So this one is a gray tone or you can get it in pure white or you can get, I think an umber tone. So that might be something to look at as something a little bit more affordable. These are also great for traveling because they're super thin and lightweight. So you can give those a try. And finally, I have <laughs> just a piece of pre-primed Claussen's linen that I've taped to a board. And this is great if you aren't sure about your composition and you wanna just see if maybe you work on part of the canvas or maybe you start over here and realize uh, it, you needed to move it over a little bit. Well, it, that's kinda nice because you haven't stretched your canvas yet or mounted it to a panel. So if you can keep it somewhat non-committal, that can be great for helping you design your composition. Um, now this is very similar to one of the Raymar panels. Um, 
but it comes on a roll. So that's an option that's also a little bit more affordable, but requires slightly less work than stretching and sizing and priming a canvas for yourself. I do have a blog post on my blog about uh, how to prime and size your own canvases and how to prepare your own linen panels. So um, I've included a link to that blog if you'd like to check that out. And maybe if you ask nicely, maybe I'll make another video about it at a later date. <laughs> All right, let's talk about my palette. It's really not that different from my standard portrait palette. Uh, really, the only main differences that I'm going to talk about are the radiant line of colors from Gamblin. We have radiant green, radiant turquoise, radiant blue, radiant violet, radiant red, radiant magenta, and radiant lemon. And these colors are essentially much higher key, more opaque colors that you can get from Gamblin. Um, and you can use them straight out of the tube. You can use them as highlight colors. You can use them for um, really either cooling down a color, usually cooling down a color, um, or slightly warming it up depending on what you're trying to mix, but without making a darker value. So for instance, if I wanted to use radiant green instead of Viridian, I could do that if I want to mix it with white or mix it with any of the other colors that I've already had mixed out on my palette for skin tones. What it will do is it will cool it down. It will add this beautiful kind of turquoisey green color to your mixture without making it darker. So that's why these colors are great in skin tones for children because many of the children that I paint have these milky light skin tones, especially these children in this painting back here. You can see a lot of these cooler tones along the arms and in the faces on the roundness of the cheeks. So I pulled from a lot of the radiant violet, radiant red, those kinds of colors for um, painting these very fair red haired children. Um, so that's one of the main differences in my palette. Um, my standard transparent dark colors are still Transparent Oxide Brown from Rembrandt, Transparent Oxide Red, and then I have Viridian, which is my go-to green. Um, once in a while, I'll pull Greenish Umber from Sennelier, and Ultramarine Blue, and Ivory Black. So this set is kind of my, my go-to that I use for my darks. You could also add Alizarin Crimson in there. Um, I use Aliz Alizarin Permanent. and. Um, most of the brands are pretty good about that. Just make sure it says permanent as well, because if it's just regular alizarin crimson, it's not going to be as archival, especially if you use thicker quantities of the paint. Um, for my ivory black, I prefer a more transparent ivory black. Usually, um, if it's more opaque, it's very hard to use it straight out of the tube. And um, generally, I don't use it straight out of the tube anyway. But it's nice to have a more transparent black because that way it doesn't get that kind of chalky sort of um, dull look once it's dried and the same goes for all of the other colors here um, for my darks i just really like them to stay as transparent as possible so that they are working with the white of the canvas behind them and they mix really well with my opaque lights so if you have an opaque light like a titanium white or in this case the warm light yellow and you mix, for instance, transparent oxide brown or transparent oxide red in with that, it makes it more of a vibrant color rather than dulling it down. So when you mix two opaques together, that creates a totally different effect. I've really kind of figured this out over the years as I've worked with skin tones, realizing that I needed varying degrees of transparency and opacity in my, in my paints to make sure that I was getting the effect of atmosphere and uh, that play of light so that the lights would come forward in space and the darks would go into the shadows. So that's really how I choose my paint colors for my palette. On the left here you can see a, a variety of oranges, yellows, and reds, and then I have a purple here on the end. So starting here I have cadmium yellow light. Um, I have yellow ochre light. You can get this in Rembrandt or um, Windsor Newton makes a pretty good one. And then I have a Rembrandt color specific to Rembrandt called Mettler Mustard. And this color, even though it looks identical to the yellow ochre, um, uh, just from the tube, it's a very different color in the sense that it is semi-transparent. 
and it mixes beautifully with white. So if you wanted to make, um, say, a highlight color or a very bright white but have some yellow in it, this is a great color to mix in without overpowering your white. And then I have um, CAD, oh wait, hold on, this one is the CAD yellow, this is the lemon yellow. So I have lemon yellow, CAD yellow pale, and then cadmium orange. This one's actually from Old Holland. It's a very highly pigmented color. Cadmium orange can be very, very different depending on the brand that you purchase. So uh, try different brands. The ones that I tend to prefer are the Old Holland because this one is so powerful. You only need a little bit and it'll go a long way. Um, but Rembrandt's Cad Orange is really good. Um, Sennelier's is really good, so try those. Um, I have Cadmium Red Light from Sennelier, and a comparative color would be Cadmium Scarlet from Windsor & Newton. So I kind of use those two interchangeably, and that color is, is great. I really use that as opposed to Cadmium Red because the Cad Scarlet tends to be more vivid and it mixes better with white. Um, it doesn't become as dull or pasty colored when you mix it with white. Sometimes you want that, you know, sometimes you want a duller red, but when I'm painting children and I'm painting those very red, perfect little lips, I wanna make sure I've got some intense colors for that. Um, I already talked about the alizarin crimson permanent. And then here in the end, this color really came in handy when I was painting um, these girls in particular. This is Sennelier's Cobalt Violet Hue, and it is an absolutely beautiful purple when you open the tube up. It's bright orchid color. Um, I use this in a lot of my peony paintings, but it's also great to have on hand for portraits. So that's a, a basic list of my portrait colors. Um, I've talked about this in other demonstrations before, the warm light yellow from Michael Harding. And I should also mention his warm white is a great color as well. So having a good um, selection of whites and uh, so, some of these kind of cheat colors that you can get are, are great for um, painting children. Brushes. So I have several different brands that I really like to work with. One of them is Robert Simmons and I use their bristle brushes, their hog hair bristles, and usually I get them in flats, but this one has sort of become a filbert over time with use. So it, it just kind of transforms and they last for a really long time as long as you keep cleaning them. So this is the Robert Simmons Signet. This one's a size eight, but I'll use anywhere from a six to a 10 or 12. Um, I still use a lot of rosemary brushes, many of their uh, sable series I'll use. This one is a, a sable um, round and this is series 33 size 8. Another example of a rosemary brush I would be using is a quarter inch pure sable. This is series 7320 and you can see that it kind of becomes thicker on the end. Um, this is such a soft bristle brush that it's great for very delicate um, blending and softening of ed edges. Another great brush for softening edges is the Rosemary Eclipse Extra Long Comber, and you can get these in, diff in different sizes. This one's about a half inch. Another Rosemary Round, Pure Sable Series 9-9. Um, another great brush for detail work. It keeps its edge really well, again, as long as you keep it really clean. And then, um, some of the other softer rosemary brushes I really like are the Pure Sable Series 77, and these are flats. So um, again, as they become used, you'll sort of lose that sharp edge, but the better you keep them clean, uh, the better the edge will stay. And these are great because they're very, very soft, but at the same time, you can still get a fairly sharp edge with them. So I love painting with these brushes um, and as well as some of the other rosemary brushes, but generally when I'm working with rosemary brushes, I'm choosing their softer, more sable kind of brushes. Um, and then if I want something with a little bit more chisel, a little bit firmer, I'll go with the Gray Matters series for oil painting. And they have um, several different lines. They have some regular bristle brushes like this one, which is similar to the Robert Simmons and probably could be a good substitute for that. This is a size 10 flat. 
Um, uh, the other series that I really enjoy is just the regular Grey Matters for Oils, series 9814, and you can get these short flats in a variety of sizes. This one is a size 6, and that's probably the size I use the most often. So these are great brushes. Highly recommend. I use them for landscape, I use them for portraits, pretty much any kind of subject matter. They work great as sort of an in-between from the stiffness of a bristle brush to the softness of a sable. So that's um, kind of a variety of brushes that I might use for painting children. M most often I'll just grab what's on hand and go with it um, and have several brushes that I'm using at once. But with children especially, I prefer the softer brushes because it really kind of caters to the nature of the subject matter. Other tools that I use are things like sandpaper. This is kind of a medium grit sandpaper, and you're probably wondering why I have this uh, in my list. But when it comes to painting children, especially if I'm painting in layers and letting them dry in maybe more classical method and painting wet over dry, sometimes sanding the surface of um, maybe the rough draft of a face can actually help make that, that face even milkier and softer as I build up the paint. So sanding off a face, adding a little bit more paint, letting it dry, sanding it down again can be one technique that you might try using for portraits of children, especially if you're going for a more classical look. Um, try it for yourself. Nobody says you have to paint children a la prima and get it all right in one shot. Uh, that's just not even practical. <laughs> and very few people are capable of doing it. So use every tool in your toolbox that you can to get it the way that you want it to look. When I am uh, oiling out a painting or I want to work back into it wet into wet or make it feel like wet into wet and it's already dry, I can use a medium like liquid or I can use a gel medium like oleo gel. Finally, I have um, a whole bunch of vine charcoal and this stuff is great for drawing in your initial design. Um, I like to keep these on hand all around my studio. Once in a while, I'll use them even over the top of a painting that I've already started. If I want to just draw in a section a little bit more accurately, um, it wipes right off. No worries at all. So you, it's a very non-committal medium, great for starting your painting. Mm -hmm.